All right. Uh, thanks, Bill, and uh, thank everyone uh, for coming. Uh, just want to make sure that everyone can see the slides because on my computer it takes a few seconds um, for this slide to show up. Okay, my name is Xu Hai Xiao, and um, I'm a paleontologist uh, at Virginia Tech in Blacksburg, Virginia. Um, can we go to the next slide, Bill? So, <clears throat> I said I'm a, I'm a paleontologist, but I, I'm also a geologist. So I travel around the, the world and, and to do field work, uh, which is a big part of my, uh, my research. Um, so I've been almost all the major continents. Um, and one of my favorite field sites was in northern Siberia, so the, the no, northernmost uh, pain on the map. Okay, next. So uh, this place is called Texi in Siberia. And uh, it is literally the end of the world if you keep going keep going to the north and, and before you hit the Arctic Ocean. Uh, this is a taxi, it's a military base of Russia. And uh, you know, at the heyday of Cold War, this was a, a, a large uh, military base uh, where the, some of the largest uh, helicopters are stationed there and the, the Russians watch the uh, Americans and, and the Canadians are across the ocean. It's, it's very tough, both physically and uh, politically, to get there. Um, next. Uh, in in Texi, uh, for example, you know, this, this photograph of me having lunch in, in the field, uh, about 50 miles, 100 miles uh, south of Texi, uh, there's an inland from the coast. Uh, there's a, a lot of mosquitoes, and uh, some really big. We have to, you know, wear a beekeeper's net uh, during work or, or during uh, uh, lunchtime to just to keep the mosquitoes away. Um, next, and so, so if you if you take a look at what we have in, for lunch, this is a uh, some onion soup. But there are maybe two dozens of uh, mosquitoes uh, in a bowl. <laughs> uh, because when you cook the soup, um, the mosquitoes send CO2 and the heat. Uh, so the plume of heat and the CO2 from the stove attracts attract a lot of mosquitoes. So there's always a small tornado of mosquitoes above the stove. And when you when you lift the lid, all the mis mosquitoes just dive into the into the pot, and it became part of your uh, delicacy. But it, but it, even so, uh, we would still prefer the dead mosquitoes than the live one. Oh, the taste, uh, the taste, not too bad. I mean, uh, it tastes pretty good. Um, but uh, you know, the dead mosquitoes are a lot lot better than the live one, because, you know, when you walk, there's a plume of mos mosquitoes behind you because you breathe up CO2 and the mosquitoes just following you. But when you stop to look at the rocks, they all come in front of you and blocking the view of you, uh, of you and uh, particularly when you try to look at the rocks, it's not that you have you know, a plume of mosquitoes so when I when I next when I tell you know this field story to my friends, my parents, um, and then my my son, you know they all, always ask me you know why you go to places like this, um, Siberia, and also you know did some field work in, in Africa, in the Himalayas, Australia, um, China, and and, and uh, in the in the Gobi Desert, so. You know, this, I, I, I went to this place uh, all because I was inspired by uh, a quote from uh, Charles Darwin uh, more than 100, uh, 160 years ago, to be exact. So in, in his book on the origin of life, uh, origin of species, uh, he wrote, consequently, 
if my theory, if his theory of natural selection, if my theory be true, it is indisputable that before the lows, the Cambrian stratum was deposited, the, the world swarmed with living creatures, and then by that he meant uh, animal life. Um, and, and of course, at that time, in the 19th century, um, there weren't any animal fossils predating the Cambrian period. Uh, so it was a problem for Darwin. But he very quickly dismissed this problem um, by recognizing that the geological record is incomplete. So he kept writing. Um, I look at the natural geological record as a history of the world imperfectly kept. Only here and there, a short chapter was preserved. And uh, only here and there, um, in each chapter, a few lines is preserved, a few pages preserved, in each line is only a few words preserved, so on and so forth. So the, maybe the entire Precambrian uh, animal record, or fossil record of animals, um, was not preserved. Next. So we before I, I uh, you know, go on to talk about what we now know about the Precambrian fossil record. I, I want to just introduce you to you the, the geological time scale. So what is shown here is the uh, you know, 4.6 billion years of the uh, Earth history, uh, which is divided into the big chunk of time, the Hadean from 4.6 to 4 billion years ago, the Archean from from 4 to 2.5 billion years ago, and the Proterozoic from 2.5 to 0.5 billion years ago, uh, uh, roughly, point, actually 0.54 billion years ago. Uh, the later part of the Proterozoic, next, uh, is divided into uh, some final geological intervals. Um, that are known as the Tonian, the Cryogenian, the Ediacaran, and the Cambrian. So the Cambrian is where the abrupt appearance of animal fossils in the geological record happened. And that is known as the Cambrian explosion, and that was what kept Darwin um, kept Darwin uh, 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 worried about uh, the fossil record, and he, he thought that any animals lived in the Precambrian time period were not preserved. So today we are going to look at the Honian, Cryogenian, and the Ediacaran period, and ask the question uh, whether there's any choices of animals in this geological time period before the Cambrian. Next. Okay, so um, there are two different ways to answer this question, you know, whether there's animal uh, before, the Cam before the Cambrian. One is to use the molecular data to look at you know, things like DNA and the protein sequences of all living animals, and then compare their differences and their similarities among different animals. And you can um, infer when two animals split from their last common ancestor uh, by studying the similarity or differences in their homologous DNA or protein sequence. And if you do that for a large number of animals, um, you can do two things. You can first put together a sort of family tree, uh, so who is more closely related to who. And two, you can also put a time scale uh, against the family tree. So in this slide, 
the left part is the geological time scale. So Iptonian, in sort of uh, brownish, the cryogenian, uh, bluish, and the Ediacaran in uh, sort of a, a beige color, and then Cambrian in a dark green. Okay, on the right side of the, the slide, that shows the family tree that is scaled against the geological time uh, using a molecular clock method, uh, just comparing the similarity and differences of the biomolecule sequence of different animals. Um, so clearly the molecular clock seems to show that animals first diverged in the Tonian period, uh, that is to say between a billion and 720 many years ago. Um, so the, some of the earliest animals split from um, for each other, uh, particularly perhaps sponge is a one of the uh, uh, animal group that split uh, very early uh, during the evolutionary history of animals. Um, and then uh, it's not until the Ediacaran period when a large number of animals uh, split. And when you look at the fossil record, we now know uh, a lot more than what Darwin knew in the 1800s. We now know that by the time you get into the Ediacaran period, uh, macroscopic animals evolved, uh, mobile animals evolved, uh, there were also animals uh, that uh, were able to uh, fed actively uh, or bury into the sediments, and uh, some of them were able to uh, prey on other animals or other organisms. And a few of them uh, actually evolved by mineralized skeletons. And, and this is a critical, this is a very important because uh, all the fossil record of animals in the Cambrian and the younger geological periods are dominated by animals with skeletons. And that's shells and, and the bones and things like that. Whereas most of the fossil that I'm going to show you today uh, that predate the, the Cambrian period, uh, they don't have skeletons, uh, with the exception of maybe a few. So that's that's what we know today, you know, based on the fossils and uh, the molecular clock. Uh, we now know there's a, a conclusive, uh, there's a very good evidence suggesting animals evolved at least in the Ediacaran um, based on the fossil record. But the molecular clock tells us that there should be animals even earlier in the cryogenian or even in the tonia. So that prompted the paleontologist to look at the geological record. So we're going to go to the next slide uh, <clears throat> to see whether there is or whether there are any animal fossils in the Tonian and the cryogenian period, as the molecular clock suggested. Now, <clears throat> uh, they Tonian fossils uh, of animals are really very controversial if there are any. Here's one uh, group of fossils uh, from the Tonian period in, in China. Um, some of them are really very simple in morphology. So on the, at the top row, you have these discoidal fossils, just about a millimeter, two millimeter in size, in diameter. This look a little discoidal structure. And all these five pictures are actually of the same specimen. And we look at the specimen using different, um, uh, different methods. Uh, light microscopy, so just look at under the microscope. Uh, and a electron, uh, scanning electron microscopy using different uh, uh, electron mode. Um, and what I want you to see uh, to look is they pan to the upper right. So it's the same specimen. And there are many on, on that panel, you can see uh, many small circles, almost like a honeycomb structure. And each of this circle is a cell. 
So imagine you take a ball of sales. So perhaps a hundred or several hundreds of sales that make it a big ball, millimeter, two millimeter in size. And then squash it on the on the ground, and that is what it is. It's it's this is a fossil that ha was interpreted as animal fossils, uh, but there's no uh, diagnostic uh, features to say that this one has to be an animal. Uh, I think it could be, but there isn't any any diagnostic feature other than it is uh, multicellular. I think an alternative interpretation is that perhaps, perhaps it is a multicellular algae, a colonial algae. Uh, yes. The bottom part of this diagram shows another uh, 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 Tonian fossil uh, that is a sort of tubular like structure. And uh, this is, uh, has something that is suggestive of animals. It actually has, some of them shows a terminal opening, uh, and some of them shows a, a sort of transverse annulation, kind of like a worm annulations, right? So this has also been interpreted as animals. And I, 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 again, I think it is a possibility um, is a tubular structure. It, it seems to have a mouse-like opening, and it seems to have uh, some annulation. Uh, but there's another equally possible interpretation, and that is a, a uh, there's a group of green alga, algae, uh, or seaweeds um, that can build tubular structures just like this, and they also have this transverse annulation, and they actually form segments that articulate, it's kind of like your, you know, sausage that, uh, you know, have this segment, uh, like Polish sausage that uh, 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 link together. Yes, uh, it's kind of segmentation, but it's, uh, it's not the kind of segmentation as, uh, as in arthropods. And it works. So we have some some uh, tantalizing evidence here, but nothing conclusive, nothing diagnostic. So let's go go to the next. Uh, in a cryogenium, um, the cryogenium is characterized by uh, pervasive and a long-lasting and a global glaciations. So this was where the snowball earth glaciation happened, a big ice age. Uh, much of the ocean was frozen to ice. And uh, uh, according to some geologists, uh, the t entire ocean was frozen from pore to pore. So even equatorial ocean uh, was frozen to ice. So there, there aren't many uh, fossiliferous rocks in the cryogenium. Uh, but in Amman, uh, there's a set of cryogenian rocks uh, that contains molecular fossils. Um, and there's a particular group of molecular fossils called 24 isopropyl cholestane, uh, or 24 IPC for short. So in the upper right, I have some of the, uh, some of the molecular structure of 24 IPC. And it is, um, yes, cryogenian is the snowball earth era. Uh, so on the upper right, I have the um, structural, molecular structure of 24 IPC, and it's the precursor. And this precursor, uh, according to some geologists, uh, is uniquely derived from a group of animals called sponges. Um, and they occur these 24 IPC molecules occur in abundance in Ediacaran and, uh, e uh, and the cryogenium um, rocks in Amman. So both cryogenium and Ediacaran. And so on the left side, you see the geological time scale, the cryogenium, Ediacaran, and Phanerozoic. 
and that spindle diagram shows the abundance of 24 IPC, and uh, um, so that would suggest that sponge uh, evolved in Pyrogenia. Go to next. But this is not uh, uh, universally accepted. Um, in fact, uh, just a few weeks ago, there's a group of uh, um, uh, 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 organic uh, geochemists uh, from uh, Germany and Australia and some other places. Uh, they concluded that this precursor of 24 IPC uh, is not diagnostically sponge. So sponges can produce the precursors of 24 IPC, uh, but some other protist can also do this. So again, the presence of 24 IPC uh, is consistent, but not diagnostic of uh, cryogenia animals. Okay, so let's move to the next slide. And in this slide, I want to show uh, I want to show some pediacrin uh, fossils. So on the left, you have the geological time scale, uh, the cryogenian at the bottom, and the ediacrin, and then the cambian at the top. Now, <clears throat> I just mentioned that the cryogenian is um, the, the era of, uh, of a snowball earth. Uh, so the last Snowball Earth event is known as the Mary Norn Snowball Earth, named after um, a set of rocks in Australia that record uh, the Snowball Earth event. And as soon as the Snowball Earth event ended, uh, this is the beginning of the Ediacaran period, which is about 635 many years ago. Next. Um, <clears throat> So in the, in the Ediacaran period, um, there's quite a number of fossils, a lot more than, uh, you know, it was zero in Darwin's time, but today we have a bunch of fossils. I'm going to show you a few of them. Uh, so this is a fossil that uh, came from the Ediacaran period, uh, a set of rock known as the Doshan Tor Formation in South China. Uh, the Doshan Tor is 635 to 551, many years uh, old. And it contains this, um, also a big a, a ball of cells. But this is a, a lot larger, and it has some, um, I, what I think is more suggestive uh, evidence for animal affinity. But still, it's not you know, universally accepted. I talk about this a little bit more later. And move to the next. Uh, so this slide shows another set of fossils, slightly younger, so about 575 to uh, 560 many years old. Uh, so perhaps uh, a bit younger than the Dershan Tor, um, but it perhaps also overlap with uh, uh, a big chunk of the Dershan Tour, uh, from Canada and the UK, um, uh, uh, England. There's a set of fossil that is much larger. This one looked a lot, like a, a piece of leaf. Um, it belongs to a group of fossil known as the Avalon assemblage. Um, but it's not a plant fossil, although it looked like a piece of leaf. Uh, it's not a plant fossil, if anything, it is perhaps more related to animals than anything else. Uh, next one. <clears throat> yeah, so younger than the Avalon uh, is the White Sea assemblage. Uh, that's named after White Sea in Russia. And the similar fossils are also found in Australia. Uh, on this cover of Nature, there's a, a picture of a fossil called Sprigaina. Uh, this is a very interesting fossil. Um, it has a left and right side. It has a head and a tail. It does look like an arthropod. Yes, it looks like an arthropod. Whether it is an arthropod or not, um, it, it's certainly not 
you know, modern type of arthropod because it does not have any appendages. It doesn't have legs uh, and it doesn't have jointed legs. And that's a, that's a hallmark of uh, modern arthropod. If anything, it might be uh, something that is related to arthropod, maybe the cousin of arthropods uh, that went extinct. Uh, so this is about 560 to 550 many years old. Uh, it, it has a left and right and head and tail differentiation and uh, nothing other than animals have this kind of differentiation. And then not only animals, it's a special group of animal, uh, uh, animals called bilateria, which you, we're going to talk about a little, bit, a little bit more later. So move to the next slide. Uh, and toward the very end of the Ediacaran period, uh, you've got fossils like this. Uh, there's something called pteridinium, um, and not only pteridinium, but is in this very late stage of Ediacaran, the last 10 million years of Ediacaran period from 550 to 560, um, I'm sorry, 550 to 540 many years ago, uh, animals began to make skeletons. And uh, it, it, although the diversity, the number of taxa that have skeletons are very few, uh, maybe a handful at most, uh, but they began to look like, uh, you know, some of the Phanerozoic and younger animal fossils in the, uh, in the sense of uh, skeletonization or mineralization. Okay, go, move to the next slide. Uh, so, and once you cross the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary, you get things like this. This, of course, is uh, Anomalocris uh, from the Burgess Shale in Canada. And here you do see things that are more convincing and more familiar to, and, uh, to what we now know as, uh, as animals. Um, it's got, uh, it's got uh, uh, appendages or limbs, or legs. Um, it's got jointed legs. For example, the uh, frontal appendages, it has uh, segments. So it, it's clearly some sort of arthropod. Okay? So there's a big difference uh, between Ediacaran and the Cambrian. OK, let's move to the next slide. So <clears throat> what we can say now is that you know, we do have a lot of fossils in the Ediacaran period. Some of them are suggestive of animals. Um, but to understand these fossils from the Ediacaran period and to make sense of these fossils uh, from the Ediacaran period, we need to be able to put them in the family tree of animals. And the Darwin recognized this uh, in, in, in the uh, 19th century. So this is a, a quote from Darwin uh, in 1837. So this is a year after he came back from Beagle. So he came back in 1836, and he wrote this. He drew a little diagram, uh, now known as the I think diagram. So he wrote, you know, case must be that one generation uh, then should be as many living as now. To do this and to have many species in same genus as is requires extinction. And that's very, very important recon recognition. So uh, he further wrote uh, be below the diagram, below the little tree, uh, thus between A and B, if you can see the tree, he labeled a few twigs as A, B, C, D. So between A and B, a man's gap of relation. So a mass gap of relation. B and a C, the finest gradation. B and a D, rather greater distinction. Thus genera must be formed bearing relation to ancient types with several extinct forms. So to illustrate what, that, what Darwin meant, I have this little dots here, you know, these uh, columns and the rows of dots. Uh, so Darwin's idea is that, you know, natural selection and the evolution should be slow and gradual, and, uh, you know, species split into more species, 
uh, again, slow and a gradual accumulation of differences. Uh, if you think the, the biological space as a two-dimensional space, uh, the morphological space, uh, why would, why would natural think that if evolution is gradual and slow and continuous uh, without extinction? If there was no extinction, then the space will feel more or less equally or you know, uniformly uh, with species that are distinct from each other by more or less you know, similar kind of distance. But if you consider some, uh, extinction, so if you move to the next slide, <clears throat> and you randomly remove some of the species, and then you get this group of dots, right? Uh, that can be separate from each other, and they form little islands. Actually, what is shown here, the dots are the extinct species. Uh, so the surviving species are uh, between the extinct species. So <clears throat> if you have extinction, then you create gaps between the islands of species, which you know, makes the genus, make the genera. So this is what Darwin was trying to explain. You now, you know, we see all the genera that they are different from each other. Each, each genus is made of species, uh, and that's because of extinction. Uh, and extinction creates gaps, and the filling these gaps requires fossils because we are studying extinct species. Let's move to the next. Uh, this turns out to be a very important recognition. Um, <clears throat> the two things here. One is, you know, putting, putting organisms, organizing organisms in trees. And the two is extinction and the gaps. Uh, <clears throat> actually, you know, uh, in a, a little before da uh, or about the same time, this is 1840, uh, by uh, Edward Hitchcock. He was not an evolutionist. He was a creationist. And um, um, yeah, so uh, yeah, someone wrote that he doesn't ex accept that, it doesn't assume all parts of the morphospace space must be filled. Yeah, th yes, that's right. Um, but randomly, it, it should be even a field, or more or less equal a field, uh, if extinction is uh, gradual, low. Now, in 1840, Hitchcock published this tree of uh, life. So he has he had plants on the left, he had animals on the right. So the flowering plants have the have the queen, uh, and uh, uh, mammals are the king. And he also saw the big morphological gap between animals and the plants. And instead of explaining this gap in terms of extinction, he saw this as evidence uh, of creation. Um, he, he, no way for him to breach these gaps, uh, particularly the fossil record was, was very sparse, and he saw this evidence of, of uh, creation of different species, uh, certainly different groups of animals and uh, plants. So Darwin's uh, recognition of the trees or organizing species in trees and uh, recognizing the importance of extinction uh, was a breakthrough uh, back in the 18th century. So let's uh, move to the next slide. Yes, uh, someone commented, um, yeah, many pre-Darwinians, and that's what uh, uh, many pre-Darwinians were religious scholars, and they recognized geological errors and extinction, but they thought that is a, you know, a evidence of separate uh, creation. Yes, that's what, uh, what uh, Hitchcock thought, and, and others did, too. Uh, <clears throat> so nowadays, of course, we have a, a more sophisticated tree than Darwin had in the 19th century. This is a version from uh, uh, more than 20 years ago, uh, 1997. Uh, this is a tree of all life, uh, including three major uh, groups or domains of life, bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. 
And all the animals, um, you know, there are millions of species of animals, okay? There are probably, you know, tens of, of, of maybe hundreds of millions of animal species that lived at one time or another on the Earth history. Uh, one of one is, is represented on the tree, and that's Homo, that's our genus, Homo sapiens. So that's a, a breached version of the tree of life. And the next one, next slide, uh, is a little more complete, but still, um, this one uh, in includes many more than the uh, many more species than the previous one, but still, this is a more a uh, very small sampling of all the living species. So you have the metazoans here that is represented not by just one species or one genus, a homo, as we did in the last slide, but by maybe you know a couple of hundreds of species in this tree. Uh, and if we look at the tree of animals in the next slide, uh, you know, they, 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 are, they are millions of animal species, uh, but this slide just to show you the skeleton of the animal uh, family tree. So we have a, a lot of animals that have a left and right side, a dorsal and a ventral, or you know, a belly side and a back side, and a head and a tail end. And this kind of animal, that includes the most majority of animals that we see today, including us, including butterflies, elephants, and fish, and, uh, and many, almost all the animals that you're familiar with. Uh, they all have a left and right side, head and tail, and, and a back and a belly side. Uh, and they make the group called bilaterium. So these bilaterians are the dominant animal group uh, that is uh, uh, living today and also in the past. Let's move to the next slide. But animals are more than just bilaterians. Uh, animals also include, in addition to bilaterians, uh, also include cnidarians. That is uh, jellyfish, sea anemones, bulls, and fossil record, uh, they don't have, strictly speaking, they don't have a left and right side, they don't have the kind of you know, belly and, and back side. Go to the next slide. Uh, and a bunch of others, I'm going to quickly, uh, you know, uh, show a couple of them here. Uh, sponges is another group of animals that don't have a head and a tail, back and a belly and a left and right. Those are very simple animals. Those are perhaps uh, the, uh, some of the earliest branches in the uh, family tree. Um, what, is, what is the most closest, the closest the living relative of animals? So we go to the next slide. And you see here, there is something very simple, something called coronaflagellates. It's a single-celled organism. And another group of uh, 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 organisms called mesomycetozoans. Um, they are colonial. Um, so there's a big difference, morphological difference, between animals and their closest living cousins, the coronaflagellates. There's an immense morphological gap between coronaflagellates and even the simplest animals, the sponges. So some of the uh, gaps are, are listed here in the next slide. For example, all animals, including sponges, um, have cell adhesion proteins to keep the cells together. They are all multicellular organisms. They all have cell differentiation. So not only this, they have many cells, but the cells are differentiated into different groups of cell, different types of cells that have different functions. And all animals have germ sequestration. That means that the reproductive cells uh, are sequestered 
uh, during the during the ontogeny, sometimes very early in ontogeny uh, or the develop, uh, development of an and the, the, the only function is to do reproduction. Uh, and also, all animals have apoptosis or uh, programmed cell death. So some cells uh, live just to die uh, for uh, you know, the uh, purpose of the entire uh, individual. And all animals have embryogenesis. They have an embryonic stage in their development or ontogeny. All animals have pattern formation, or most of them have pattern formation. That's what makes the left and right side different, the head and tail different, the belly and the back side different, for example. And then the list can go on and on and on. Uh, none of the coinoflagellates have these features. Uh, the coinoflagellates might have some genes uh, that can do these things, but they don't actually, the genes don't actually do these things as they do. So there's an immense morphological gap between the coinoflagellates and animals. Now, everything here together you know, are called the holozoans, so animals plus coinoflagellates plus mesomycetozoans. So in order to understand um, the origin and the early evolution of the animals, we need to understand the gap. And in order to fill the gap, we need to look at the extinct transitional forms that, to, that can help us to fill the gaps. Because as Darwin showed, you know, it's extinction that result in these gaps. And now to reconstruct these, these steps of evolution toward animals, we need to go to look at the fossil record. Okay. Uh, so why the anticipation? If we, if we go to look at the fossil record, particularly if, the, if we want to fill the gap between quinoflagellates and animals, we have to recognize that this intermediate form or transitional form or transitional animal, uh, they're kind of half animals or maybe 95% animals or maybe 5% animals. They're not the kind of animals like what we expect to see in modern animals and bulk animals. Uh, they have some, but not all the features that are present in living animals. So that pose a significant challenge. Uh, if we find them, how to recognize them, and sometimes they even evolve their unique features. Uh, so I have three dots here, the blue dots, and the, the pink dots, and uh, the red dots. So this, this transitional and extinct animals, there's 50% animals, there's 90% animals, uh, <clears throat> are what we call stem group animals in a technical term. So sometimes I use the term stem group animals. That means they're transitional between coinoflagellates and animals, but they're on the animal side rather than on the coinoflagellates. Side. Okay. Uh, a question here: uh, Doesn't punctuated equilibrium predict the gap in evolution? Um, punctuate, punctuated equilibrium uh, does not necessarily. Uh, uh, produce, um, let me see, okay, it, it does predict gaps in evolution, but it doesn't mean that we have to look at the fossil record to understand the gaps. So punctuated equilibrium just say sometimes you have rapid evolution followed by slow evolution. So that, yes, it can produce gaps. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to use a few examples to illustrate the challenges in interpreting and understanding some of the Ediacaran stem group animals. Um, and this is one of example um, that was published in 1998, uh, so uh, more than 20 years ago. Uh, this are a group of fossils. You have you can see a, a scale bar here. Each of this little thing is about half millimeter in diameter. And they're made of cells, and the cells can divide. So one cell divide into two, four into eight, sixteen. So the cell number doubles, whereas the cell size decreases exponentially. Uh, the entire organism maintains a similar size, 
Um, okay, so yeah, this have been interpreted as animal embryos. So they have the kind of development of cell division um, that reminds us of animal embryonic develop development. Um, and they don't feed, of course, they don't grow, just like uh, modern animals. They actually encased in this ornamented envelope. Uh, so this has been interpreted as stem group animal embryos. Uh, it is still controversial. Not everyone agrees with this, this interpretation. But I would like to say that, you know, for example, the T-shaped uh, cell junction here requires the cells uh, that cell membrane are flexible. They don't have cell, cell walls. So they're not plants. They're not algae. Um, and also, as the cell divides, um, the, uh, the deformation of the cell seems to indicate that they probably had cell adhesion proteins to keep the cells together. And uh, uh, this all together suggests, I think, uh, more likely to be uh, related to, or more closely related to animals than to anything else. Uh, here, the next slide is uh, animation to show you the configuration of the four cell stage. Um, so I think uh, we we need to move to the next slide. I forgot to tell you that. Yeah, move to the next slide. Yeah, this one. Uh, so if you uh, skip the previous slide and you look at this slide, uh, if you can look at the animation, um, this shows the separation of the uh, four cells. Uh, the amazing preservation. The cells are preserved three-dimensionally, uh, no deflation. So it's almost like uh, the cells are frozen into the rock. So yes, this is amazing preservation. So if our interpretation is correct, uh, then I would place these animal embryo fossils uh, somewhere between the clinoflagellates and animals. And uh, considering that they had probably had, had no cell wall, they probably had uh, um, cell adhesion protein, and there's some recent evidence suggests that they even had uh, 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 programmed cell death. So I think more likely they're on the animal side. In other words, they're, they're probably uh, stem group animals. So if you have stem group animals, what about you know, stem group uh, eumetazoans, uh, which are the cnidarians plus the bilaterians, and the stem group Bilaterians. Do you have fossils? This kind of fossils in the in the Ediacaran period. And the short answer is yes. Um, so if we move to the next slide, so this is where we put uh, you know that uh, that uh, um, phylogenetically or in the family tree of animals, where we put that uh, embryo. Uh, in the next slide. Um, I have a few examples of stem group eumetazoans, uh, which include cnidarians and uh, bilaterians, and the stem group bilaterians. So I'm going to show evidence of this. So go to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> earlier, we talked about some of the sponge biomarkers, and uh, there's a possibility that this uh, represent uh, stem group sponges. Like I said earlier, this is not universally accepted. Um, it's still uh, 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 controversial evidence. Next slide. But we do have, in the Ediacaran time period, um, something that we think a very convincing evidence, fossil evidence, for stem group, uh, perhaps stem group tenophores. So tenophore is a uh, group of animals that is related to the cnidarians, um, and uh, they are colloquial, colloquially known as a comb jelly. Um, typically, they, ha they, are, they are 
eight fold symmetrical. Um, they have uh, eight ten rows or comb rows. So eight fold symmetry is not very common among living organisms. And a ten of folds or comb jellies are one group of this eight fold symmetry. Then we have a group of fossils that are called uh, ear andromeda. So <clears throat> this fossil is, yes, someone asked whether Cnidarian includes corals and the jellyfish. Yes, Cnidarian includes jellyfish and the corals. Uh, I'm talking about here a group of animals that is related to Cnidarian uh, that is known technically known as pinafores or colloquially known as a comb jelly, uh, but it's not jellyfish. Uh, so it's characterized by this eight-fold symmetry, and uh, uh, this is very likely uh, related to comb jelly. And this is found not only in as this compression, so they're squashed on the bedding surface. You can see the eight uh, the eight, uh, eight uh, uh, arms, the spiral arm, when you look from the top, it's all with a uh, clockwise uh, spiral. You look from the bottom, it, it's, uh, it's counterclockwise. And then go to the next slide. Uh, you also find the same thing in Alshalia, in sandstone. This is a sort of uh, more, a different kind of preservation. But it's the uh, same thing as the previous one from, uh, from South China that is squashed on the bedding surface. Uh, it has some, some feature that is similar to living comb jelly, but is critically different from modern comb jelly. Again, suggesting this dam group concept, uh, extinct uh, transitional form that have some, but not all the features of the living uh, uh, relative. And sometimes they have they have their own uh, features. And the one thing they don't have is the uh, is the tentacles that all or most living um, uh, comb jellies have. Next one. <clears throat> so this is a reconstruction of what what it looked like uh, eel and uh, eel andromeda look like in life. Uh, is a little spirally. Uh, 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 arm that eight of it. Uh, it's is probably either benthic or, or plankton uh, or pelagic. Uh, so this is uh, this is a, a, a uh, certainly a uh, uh, something related comb jelly. Here, next one. <clears throat> this is another thing from uh, younger rocks from the from the early Cambrian, about five hundred twenty-five many years old or five hundred twenty many years old. Uh, this is another stem group, uh, tenafold. Uh, it again, has these eight flaps, almost like, like the revolving doors. And revolving doors typically have four, uh, four panels, but you know, imagine a revolving door that has eight uh, panels uh, with the center axis. And the bottom has a little skirt that also have eight pleats. Um, and it has many tenafold structures, but it's got the spokes. Uh, make it a, a very rich structure. So it's, uh, 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 that's something that living tenophores don't have. So again, we think it is uh, another example of comb jellies in the Cambrian. So next one. So if we have spawns, you have stem group animals, stem group spawns, and stem group comb jelly, what are stem group bilaterians? I have a couple of things here that I think uh, will lead it to you uh, by Latarians and then maybe stem group by Latarians. I showed, showed you sp uh, Spigina earlier, but this is something uh, known as a Yogia. Uh, <clears throat> again, it has a left and right side, head and tail, and a dorsal and a ventral. Uh, and this guy actually it has, you know, fossils on, on the left panel is on the, on the top right. Uh, on the right panel is at the bottom, but on, if you look at the left panel, there's a series of these ovoidal or circular uh, structure uh, that is actually, they're actually the footprint of the same organism that is preserved on the upper, uh, upper right, meaning that it probably moved to make this footprint. Same thing on the right panel, so you have this animal that is at the bottom, 
but above it, uh, you have uh, can uh, see at least two footprints. So there's some sort of bilaterium, but also can move. If you go to the next one, that's the uh, that's the animation. I can't show the animation here. You guys can uh, take a look at the animation. I think, uh, uh, Bill has the link. And if you go to the next one, um, you can see here is. Another, so I give you a, a minute or maybe a few seconds to look at the animations, perhaps, or you can look at it later. Uh, <clears throat> this is another thing called Kimberella. Again, it has a left and right side, a head and a tail, and a top and a bottom, or, or those and the ventral. Uh, this guy, it also moved, but it, unlike the footprint in the previous in Yogi. This one actually pushed this way against the sediment. So on the left, you see the animal uh, preserved on the top batting surface. On the in the middle, you see this animal actually moved backwards. So the top part of the animal, the front side end of the animal, actually have a little proboscis. It's extended beyond the animal, and it, it, it has mouth and perhaps teeth in its mouth. And it actually scraped the sediment to collect food particles from the scums in the seed in the sediment. So it feeds, it worked backwards and the feed from the sediment. Same thing on the right panel. You see that the front part of the animal actually is deformed. So not just you know, movement, but this guy have had muscle. And probably the kind of locomotion or movement is self-powered. Then again, the next, move to the next slide, we have a little animation showing how it moved and uh, uh, how it might have moved. Um, and I go to the next one. And if there, there's actually a number of trace fossils, for example, barrels, tunnels within the sediment uh, that are made, uh, made by, certainly by animals. And Nothing but bilaterian animals could have made this kind of tunnels. In this uh, slide, uh, we are looking at we are looking at the tunnels uh, from the top side. So the sediment actually pushed up. Uh, so this is clear evidence um, for uh, bilaterial animals. Move to the next one. And sometimes they have. Uh, very high density. This is, uh, you know, several tens of these uh, uh, barrels or tunnels within sediment. And uh, this is actually a close up. If you move to the next slide, you see the density in the big slide. So the previous slide is just part of this, uh, this big slab that have thousands of barrels on it. So the sediment are churned up and they turn upside down that have a significant biogeochemical uh, impact on a global scale. Uh, there are actually tracks. If you move to the next slide, you'll see that uh, this is actually an animal that, that probably moved uh, to make the tunnels and then move out of the sediment and then make a row of, uh, you know, two rows of uh, tracks. Uh, so this animal probably had legs. Uh, so that would be something important because the legs um, make it possible to walk so to, and do, do a number of things. To, some, some animals use legs to run to, from, the, uh, from the predators to mate, uh, to fight, uh, and do a number of things. So it's a very important inno uh, innovation. Move to the next. We have a little animation here. Yeah, I apologize, we cannot run the animation, but I think Bill has the animation. Uh, and you can go to YouTube and take a look at this. It actually has the animation and also the fossil. So you can link the animation and the fossils in the same movie. If we move to the next slide, um, this is a phylogenetic tree or the family tree of animals. Again, I have the three groups of bilateral animals uh, that are known as uh, ectisozoans in green, the lophochocozoans in red, 
and uh, the uh, deuter stones in purple. These are the three groups of animals. Uh, some of them have legs. If you move to the next slide, uh, so the thicket branches have legs, so, you know, human um, and tetrapods, and also arthropods uh, have legs. So some people think that perhaps the last common ancestor of bilaterian uh, had legs, or at least had the genetic possibility to make legs. Whether they actually had legs or not is a question that we need to test by looking at the fossil record. So that's why the, this kind of fossil from Precambrian, uh, the trace fossils, the tracks, uh, are, are very important. Uh, move to the next slide. So um, I mentioned very earlier that toward the very end of the Ediacaran period, we have a few animals that learn how to make uh, skeletons. Uh, this is one of them. There are a handful of these species uh, in the Precambrian that learn how to make mineralized skeletons. So <clears throat> making mineralized skeleton is very, ex a very expensive metabolically. Uh, so why animals bother to make skeletons? Uh, one of the possibility is that you know animals make skeletons to protect themselves against predators, uh, and this is a, in some I think a smoking gun evidence for uh, the predation protection. Um, so on the right, you see a, a, a this is a blow up picture of uh, the side of one of those two blow fossils called Claudina uh, that have skeletons, and you see a little circular hole that is made by a predator. Uh, so this clearly suggests that you know, there were predators back then. Maybe they are not very big, but they did pose a threat. And a, a uh, big way to fend them off is to armor yourself, or to become big, or to become a predator yourself, or to make a skeleton and make it more difficult for the predators. So that uh, leads to the arms races, and that perhaps the ecological driver uh, that caused the explosive evolution during the Cambrian. So actually, you know, the 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 the, the uh, uh, lead uh, to what the uh, or the fuse to what the Cambrian explosion is in the Yakran period. So let's go to the next slide. So to summarize. Um, you know, we do have stem group animals, uh, certainly stem group bilaterians in the Ediacaran period, and perhaps before the Ediacaran period, considering that the fossil record is never complete. And it's possible that stem group animals and the stem group yeah, uh, eumetazoans and stem group sponge uh, evolved in the cryogenian and uh, perhaps in the Tonian. And uh, keep in mind that, uh, you know, A, fossils, the fossil record is incomplete, and uh, B, the interpretation of some of these stem group can be challenging. And uh, C, we are continue uh, discovering new fossils in the Ediacaran and the Ordal rocks. Let's go to the next slide. So this is uh, just a, you know, putting all the fossils that I, I've talked about uh, on the family tree of, of, of uh, animals and their relatives. So I talked about the metazoan um, em embryo animals. I talked about some molecular fossils that perhaps sponge, bilaterians. Um, I talked about some uh, you know, pinnacles. Uh, so there are a bunch of fossils in the Ediacaran period. Um, move to the next slide. So, and the next, I think this two slides, uh, you know, I talked about this uh, same slide earlier. It, this is just to show you, again, to recapitulate uh, the time scale and the molecular clock data and the, the fossil data, putting all together on the same page. Diptonium, so Phrygenian, Ediacaran, Cambrian, and Ordovician, that's the next stage, uh, next period. I have the molecular clock suggesting that diverged in the Tonian period. Uh, we don't have any conclusive fossil from the Tonian. 
Uh, but studying in the cryogenia, we got some hint of animals, uh, sponge animals. In the diagram, we have a bunch of animal fossils, including bilateral animals, including uh, mineralization, uh, by, uh, animal bimineralization, animal embryos, etc. So move to the next. So if Darwin were alive today, what he, what he would say, um, he'd be satisfied. Uh, I think he would, he would certainly be happy to see, you know, this large number of animal fossils in the, car, in the Iliacran and the perhaps order rocks. Uh, but he, I think he would be disappointed that we didn't find animal uh, as old as a billion years old, because that's what he predicted. He uh, envisioned that the missing part of the animal evolution history uh, was as long as the recorded part record. Uh, but, you know, I think we are taking a sort of a, 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 uh, a compromise here. You know, it's not as Darwin, uh, uh, not as ancient as Darwin uh, suggested, but it's certainly before the uh, Cambrian. And one other thing uh, I think Darwin would be disappointed is that the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary uh, remains an important geological and evolutionary divide. Uh, something ecologically evolutionally uh, happened at the boundary and make it the Cambrian evolution very different from the Ediacaran. So how did that, what is it? The next slide. What I think uh, it's important is that the, uh, the arms race uh, or things like this, or ecological uh, feedback, positive feedback. So uh, this slide here uh, shows, uh, you know, to make animals, you need to have a few things. You need to have the capability to make an animal, the genetic possibility to make an animal. Yeah, someone asked whether the pretermian Cambrian boundary is 543. Uh, roughly, yes, yeah, so 540, about 540 million years. Uh, defined by a barrel, yes. Uh, <clears throat> so to make an animal, you must have the genetic possibility to make an animal. You must have the kind of environment in which animal life. Uh, but making animal uh, is not the Cambrian explosion. The Cambrian explosion is not the origin of animals. It's the explosive evolution of animals. It's the acceleration of evolution rate uh, of animal evolution. So what I think happened during the Cambrian is the positive ecological feedback. And, and that is, we kind of saw a hint of this in the late Ediacaran when you see the skeleton, uh, skeletonized animals and the drill holes. You sort of have a taste of this, uh, this uh, arms races in the late Precambrian, late Ediacaran. So that accelerated in the Cambrian and it became a, a, the explosives of the Cambrian explosion. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, the next slide sort of uh, captured this in a, in a uh, paternalistic way, you know, the, uh, the positive uh, ecological feedback. It's a, it's a driver to drive uh, evolutionary innovation. Uh, so the next one. Oh, yeah, so uh, let's skip this one. I just, uh, another quote from Darwin, I want to just wrap up my talk by um, thanking many of my colleagues, my students, and the funding agencies, NASA, NSF, uh, American Chemical Society, and um, my university at Virginia Tech. So thank you very much. Of course, I'd be happy to take any, any questions if you guys have any. So how, how are we going to do this, Bill? Uh, are we going to, so people are typing questions. Uh, they're coming so rapidly, and so many of them picks. So here's one question. Do molecular clock models include adjustment for low CO2 levels and metabolism, which would lower the uh, mutation rate? Yes, the modern type of molecular clock can take this into consideration. So they do a lot of statistical tests uh, to account for the variable rates. 
So that's a, a short answer to your question. And if I missed any any questions during my talk, I was doing I was looking at my presentation and looking at uh, at the screen, the uh, second live screen, because my the picture doesn't show up very well on my second live. Uh, I had to use PowerPoint, but I might have missed a few questions during the presentation. Okay, here's uh, for someone new to you, uh, Second Life. Okay, yeah, this is my second, this first time. This is my first time in Second Life. Uh, is there any way to know what is possible in mobile space? Uh, what gap to expect? To expect? Uh, yes, so there are two ways to do this, right? So one way is a theoretical mobile space. So uh, there are certain part of the mobile space is not possible theoretically, uh, so you can exclude those. Uh, the second um, way to look at this is empirical. Uh, so you know evolution. Um, if you presumably you know if evolution happened long enough, uh, it can explore much of the feasible uh, mobile space, um, and uh, you can look at. The empirical data and uh, and uh, to see whether which part of the morpho space is crowded, which part is empty, and uh, try to answer the question why it's empty. Uh, most likely, it has some functional constraint. It has some uh, uh, evolutionary constraint. Uh, for example, if my uh, ancestor had four legs, uh, then you know my descendants are going to have four legs. So we can have six legs or eight legs. So that's evolution constraint. Uh, sometimes with developmental constraints, so for example, if I put a limb here, I can't put other structure in the same place at the same time. Uh, and sometimes it's just theoretically, theoretically impossible. For example, you know, uh, trying to give us, you can't be a, um, uh, you can't live in a, a completely in a, in a deep ocean and in a sediment and it still be a photosynthetic organism because there's just no sunlight there. So that's theoretically impossible. Yeah. But other than that, you know, they, they are some function, uh, functional, some uh, evolution constraints and a theoretical constraints. I'm not sure the mobile space is explored. Okay, I guess uh, you know, that's uh, the question I have so far. Uh, so it's the recording is okay, the sound, and thank you, and th thank you, Chantal. Thank you very much. Thank, thank all of you for attending. I'm uh, sorry it went a little longer than an hour. Um, part of that is because I had, I had a lot of animations so I have to break up some one slide into several. Um, uh, is there part three of the topic? Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, Bill. I don't know whether you have it, something else lined up for the same for the uh, chemical explosion. Yeah, the animations. Uh, Bill can send you guys the uh, the link. Uh, so um, you know they're on YouTube. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The trilobite fossils.
Oh. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs>